636. Yeah. Keep him guessing. It's a New Testament. It's a 50 50 shot, man. I preached on this a while back, but the Lord brought it back to me. You know. As it says, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father is also merciful. That's easier said than done. It really is. But Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. He will fight for your battles. Just call on him. When it seems impossible in that thing, when someone's stabbing you in the back, or you're having a rough day, or whatever it may be, the Lord's right there. It's part of this about long suffering. It's a part of patience. It's part of everything that we need. I heard a pastor today. I forget his name, but the good guy is Jesus in the Bible, and the bad guy is the devil. And you see yourself past, present, and future in the Bible. You were just a sinner, present, still a sinner, but future. You're sanctified through His blood. So when we learn more about the Word of God inside out, outside in, and we understand who God is and how He works, that's when He works the best. Because the more we feed on to the daily bread, it just grows us inside out, outside in, and, and transform us. And any other book can't not do that, whether it be a Yellow Pages or Harry Potter or whatever. It be the only Word of God can change us. For it's sharper than a two-edged sword. That's why I call it a sword. But the red letters and the black and white letters are the ma main important parts of this book. Any other book? I can tell you a little bit, but this tells you how to get to heaven. How about now? Yeah. What? <laughs> We're going to be in Genesis. Where's that? <laughs> you can't find Genesis. You better read a little more. <laughs> Genesis. If you can't find Genesis or Revelation, something you ain't been in the Bible much. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Genesis chapter fourteen. A Christian life is the best life you can live. Amen. It is awesome. Amen. I know this because I've lived both lives. I lived as a sinner for 27 years. And I lived by myself even, you know, bachelor, whatever. And married, but a Christian life is the best one. Now, I'm not saying a Christian life is going to be, have no trouble, because it does. You'll have the normal things go on, but you also have spiritual warfare going on. Now, lost, they probably have it too, but they just don't understand it. But we understand the spiritual warfare going on, because God has showed us through His Word, and we have the Spirit of God that lives within us. So he helps us in this. All the things that we do, we got a big, big help. Amen. I mean, know that. We got a big help. But, but, a lot of people bring a lot of trouble in their life that is totally unnecessary. And they won't blame it on the devil. And they're the one that opens the door to the devil. 
Then they wonder, why is my life in such a mess? Well, why did you open the door and let the devil in? <laughs> That's why. You remember, even Job accused God, not Job, but Satan accused God of protecting Job. He couldn't get to him. Why? Had a hedge about him. Couldn't get to him. <laughs> How many knows that God has got a hedge about you also? If he had a hedge about Job, he got to be even bigger one about you because the Spirit of God lives in you. He's got a hedge about you. And the devil can't do anything to you unless God allows it. But I really believe that God's people even will open that hedge and let the devil in sometime. Sad. And we will look at a, a person, a time here. There was a time when Abraham, we used to be back on Abraham. We can't get away from Abraham for some reason. And he had a nephew named Lot. Everybody know that? And if you look, Lot, Abraham was very well off. And Lot was pretty well off himself. And they grew so big that the herdsmen, the cattle herdsmen, would fight among themselves. So they was disagreeing among themselves, and, and Abraham said, you know, we don't need to do this. this there's plenty of land. Let's, you go one way and I'll go the other. Right? Pretty much. And Lot's problem was <laughs> he had to look at Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where he went. I mean, he didn't have to go there, but he did. And all his substance he took down there. It was a bad choice. It was a real bad choice. And ended up, five kings, I believe, attacked Sodom. And they took Lot the nephew of Abraham, with them. So four kings got beat, right? Sodom had a king, so they had a king ruling over them. And we'll look at him in just a minute. But four kings and five kings fought against each other. I, th I believe this is right. My memory served me right. And the king of Sodom and them got beat. Okay? Everybody listen. King of the Sodom got beat. And Lot was taken with them. And so all these kings was defeated. And church, what did Abraham do? Abraham, the herdsman, <laughs> tent dweller, right? Armed his men and went after the, these kings. Yeah, and what did God do for Abraham? He, he blessed him. He defeated him. <laughs> These are not trained warriors. These are herdsmen. But God still blessed them to defeat all these kings. Then we come, Abraham comes back, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 2. And we come to this scripture. That these made war, <coughs> excuse me, that these made war with, is that Berea? Berea, king of Sodom. See, that's who the king of Sodom was. And with Berea, king of Gomorrah. You got Snyder. <laughs> no, I don't know what his name is. And you got these kings, all right? All right, I'm going to skip on down to, to verse 12. And they took Lot, Abraham's, Abraham's son's brother's son, that's why he's there, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So see, Lot lost everything he had. 
Lost it all. Then you go to 21. And the king of Sodom, as Abraham came back, said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from thee a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou saidest, say, should have say, I have made Abram rich. <laughs> so Abraham didn't take nothing back, didn't take none of these spoils, and he would not allow the king of Sodom to say that he made Abraham rich. See? He wanted everybody to know who blessed him and who gave him all that he had and who protected him. It wasn't the king of Sodom that defeated the other kings. It was Abraham through the power of God. And herein where we get into a mess sometimes. We open the door. See, Abraham shut the door. See him shutting the door? On this, God gave him wisdom. Because he knew, hey, this ain't just something. God already knew and it was in Abraham's heart. And he knew if he took this stuff that the king of Sodom was going to be bragging. Amen. I'm the one that blessed Abraham. Oh, I, I did this. Yeah, see? So he shut the door. And that's, what, that's the wisdom we got to have. Amen. To shut doors, keep them shut. With people wants to turn around and say that they helped you or they did this for you or they done that, whatever. You know. Now some people, Junior, want to help you and they will and they will say a word about it. Amen. Amen. And that's all right. Thank the Lord, right? But we, we see something that happens later on and we got to look at the city of Sodom here just a little bit more. And it tells a little bit more about the city of Sodom in the, uh, let me look, in the New Testament, we'll go there. I think it's in Matthew. Find it. Scriptures. Matthew 24, 37. I'm getting to something, so bear with me, okay? It says, but as... That's Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, okay, we're looking at Sodom and Gomorrah and the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, get this now, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark. In Luke 17, 28 tells us, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Amen? Amen. And... In the book of Ecclesiastics, so we read in chapter 5, verse 18. Get this now. Behold that which I have seen. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him for it is his portion. Okay, so look here. Do y'all get this now? It is good, okay? It is good and comely for you to eat and to drink and enjoy the good. Enjoy the fruits of your labor, in other words, all right? 
It's good to do that. <coughs> and I just read to you that in Lot's time and in Noah's time, they was marrying, giving in marriage and all this, eating, drinking. So what's the difference? What's the difference between what Solomon is saying and what they was doing in the time of Lot and the time of Noah? What's the difference? I mean, God bless his people today. Do you enjoy the fruit of your labor? Sure you do. He wants you to. In the days of Noah, that's all they was doing was enjoying the fruit of their labor. It, they went after, matter of fact, they went after every imagination of their heart. Continually, the Bible says. And so did Sodom and Gomorrah. They went after every pleasure, every desire, everything they wanted. And that's what they did continually. Let's see, was that in days of Lot or is that in the days we live in now? <laughs> Come on, yeah, really? Isn't that what people do today? They're continually, as the same way in Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Noah, continuing going after the pleasures of life. I mean, they take that in Ecclesiastics literally. <laughs> Enjoy the fruits of your labor. That's all they do. Want to enjoy the fruits of their labor. What's wrong with that picture? Because that's not the first thing you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> the first thing we're supposed to be doing, and we said it the other day, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And then these other things will be added. You can enjoy it. But the Bible tells us, amen, that there is a season to everything. A time and a season for everything, praise God. There'll be a time to enjoy the fruit of your labor. But the first thing that people have to do, and it's more enjoyable than the other stuff, <laughs> is to acknowledge God and worship Him and do what He tells us to do and live the way He wants us to live. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's not what's happening, though. I know a lot of you haven't probably read this book, but it's called Pilgrim's Progress. Now, if you haven't read it, and if you're a reader, you like to read, I encourage you to read it. I believe, the last time I checked, it was the second bestseller in the entire history. You everybody know what the first bestseller is? The Bible is. But Pilgrim's Progress was written back in the 1800s. And there is an updated, bridged version where you can understand it because you don't understand it back then. But it's a journey. And it's, a, it's an allegory of a man by the name of Christian who leaves the city of destruction. He gets saved and all this and he's going to the celestial city. He's on his way. And on his way there, he finds a companion named Faithful, and they're both going on to Celestial City. They go through all kinds of trials and tribulations and all this, and it just brings it down to real life stuff, actually. But the one story I want you to point out to you tonight is the uh, evangelist, a friend of theirs that helped them on this journey. That was his name. He come to them later on on the trip, and he sits down and he tells them that they're about to enter into a city. And in that city, one of them would die and maybe both of them. They thought they'd done good so far, Sister Sue. They'd battled this and that and came through. They thought they'd come through the roughest part of it all. But he informed them that they had not come through the roughest part of it all. They was getting ready to go in this city and they had to pass through this city to get to the celestial city. There's no other way. They couldn't go around it. They had to go through it. And the name of that city was Vanity Fair. It was a one endless fair. 
that went on continually. And in that, in that town, in that city, you could find every, anything you wanted. Anything, I'm telling you, anything. Any worldly pleasure, any worldly games, any worldly pursuit that you wanted, it was in that city. And when they entered into the city, they was just going to pass through. They wouldn't let them. People started coming up to them. Buy this of me. Buy this. Oh, come play this. Oh, you know, flirting with them. All this stuff. And as they kept turning them down, saying, no, you know, I mean, kept walking on, they wouldn't stop. The crowd would get around them and they stopped them because they wouldn't purchase or take place. And they couldn't understand that because they hadn't seen that before. Finally, faithfully yelled out, no! And everybody stopped. Because they didn't understand. Somebody didn't want what they had for sale. So they arrested them. Took them to the judge. And he said, we're not. And faithful was trying to tell them, we don't want any of your goods. All we're seeking is the love of God, peace, the joy, eternal life. And he said, you all... You can't give us that. You don't sell that here. So the judge asked, do we sell that? <laughs> and all of them said, no, we don't sell that here. They, they admitted, they don't sell that here. And I'm telling you, you go out in the world and the things of the world, you'll find out also that they don't sell it either. Amen. If you're looking for the true love, true joy, true peace and happiness, Amen. eternal life, contentment and all that, amen, just like Faithful said, only the king can give you that. Yeah. Only the king. So they got mad at them. They thought they'd just send them out and to the town again and beat them. And that's what they did. They beat them, trying to get to show the people that there was nothing to these two men. But these two men would not fight back, and they just showed love. So they decided to kill them. And so they took faithful killed him and locked Christian up and killed Faithful and Christian Hopeful came, a man by the name of Hopeful came, released him let him out secretly and joined him later because he believed of what these two men was preaching but the thing about it is see this is, yeah it's an allegory it's a story But the sad thing is that too many people are stuck in Vanity Fair. <laughs> They're stuck in the pleasures of life. Just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they don't even see it. And all they want to do is enjoy. I just want to enjoy my life. Is there more to life than just enjoying the things of this world? Is that all there is? Man, if that's all, all there is, we might as well just quit and hang it up. That's not what life is about. I heard one preacher the other day, when he asked the question of the congregation, said, what is life about? What is life about? Do you, have you found out the meaning of life yet? I found it out. I, I found out the meaning of life. I know what it is. But a lot of Christians even don't even know what the meaning of life is yet. They think the meaning of life is just go to church on Sunday morning, then go do whatever else you want to the rest of the week, and then come back again, and you're all right. You know, you just listen to the preacher preach, uh, and man, sing a song or something like that. Hey, man, if that's all Christianity is in people's heart, hey, man, they're missing out on the biggest part of it and the best part of it, praise God. That's not even close to the meaning of life. The greatest meaning of my life is not going on vacation. I like it with my family sometime when it's time. It's not watching something on TV. It's not the meaning of my life. It's not sitting down at a nice steak. I like steak, so, you know. 
That's not the meaning of my life. It used to be when I was lost. I lived for the party. My check, it would go for a party. <laughs> That's what my life was about. That was the meaning of my life. Try to be the life of the party. <laughs> when I did something, I tried to do it well. So, you know, I went at it wholeheartedly. <laughs> concerts, rock concerts, all kinds. You know, that's, you know I just did it. But well, that ain't the meaning of life. I mean, a lot of these things are good, family, friends, and all this. But if that is your whole life, what happens when those friends and family disappoint you? What happens when they die and pass away? You just stop existing? What happens when, if you, even if your meaning of life is church, I mean, it has to be even more than that. So what, what is going to compel us to live every day, to work every day, to enjoy every day, to, to rejoice every day? Amen. What is the, really the core meaning who we are and why we're here? There's only one. His name's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of my life. <laughs> Man, there's a whole bunch encompassed in him. Meaning of my life expands greater knowledge and wisdom than the world can even contain. So my life will never be bored, Sister Sue. <laughs> it's never boring. I can't understand Christians saying they're bored. Man, don't they know the scope of who Jesus is? How can you ever be bored when you're, when you're meaning your life is God Almighty? Amen. The Son of God, praise God, that has all power in heaven and earth. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I don't even know how far he's going to take me. So I can't say, man, well, that's as far as I've gone, Brother Dave. This is as far as I'm going to ever go in my life. No. <laughs> It's endless. I, I, don't know what it, I don't know what the future holds for me here on this world. I don't know what it holds partially in heaven. Amen. And that's vast beyond my, I can't even begin to comprehend what's waiting for us on the other side. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, my meaning of my life is Jesus. Praise God. I hope it's, I don't know if you can comprehend it or not. <laughs> but when I go to bed at night, He's the meaning of my life. When I wake up in the morning, He's the meaning of my life. He's the main portion of my life. That's why I get up in the morning. That's why I breathe. That's why I exist. For Him. For Him. And then He'll use you, me, everybody else, however He wants to. And he has the wisdom, knowledge to be able to do that because he's God. Amen. See, I don't have to begrudge what he's doing in your life. I don't have to be jealous of what he's been doing in anybody's life. I don't have to be jealous of anybody's money, material thing. Amen. Because those things are just vanity fair. They're vain. They have no meaning, no substance. And people sit all the time. They'll sit with things that are just dead brain stuff. <laughs> and their whole life will be that. I remember a time when I was lost. I was living in sin. <laughs> Wasn't nowhere where I want, need to be. My girlfriend was taking all my money, so I didn't have none of that. <laughs> so the only thing I had left to do, I got in this video game. So I'd work all day, man, I, I, and I lived. I had to conquer that game. <laughs> Anybody been there? The game was Zelda. Anybody? <laughs> I had to, I can't even remember what it was, some big monster at the end, though. You had to feed. I had to conquer that game. It took me, it took me a long time. 
But I, I finally got it. And you know what? No, nah, it wasn't no satisfying. So there it was. Now what I do, Dave? <laughs> I done achieved my goal. Me and my life. So I tried to go with another name. They didn't know them. I didn't like them. So <laughs> amen. So that, that ended. And... But you know, that's people's real life right now, though. And it's such an empty one. And a dead end rope. Dead end rope. Hmm. Vanity, vanity. And so many brothers and sisters have landed in the vanity. They've taken hold of it. And it's, but the problem is, see, they think they've taken hold of it, but it's actually taken hold of them. Young man used to preach here. Loved him, still love him. He used to serve God, and it was his main purpose. But now his main purpose is drinking. Drinking. He's a drunk. He turned from the greatest master to a lesser master. Alcohol. See, it doesn't possess him. He doesn't possess it. It possesses him. And it's vanity. It's a dead end road. And the purpose of your life, drink yourself into a grave. What a sad life. Purpose of your life, see how many people you could sleep with in your time? Really? Purpose of your life, see how big you can get your bank account? I mean, you know, what are, all these are. And, and the rich man, a man in there, he, he had a bumper crop, remember? Yep. That's what he thought. Oh, I'm going to tear my barns down, build bigger barns, and, and uh, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back, and he says this too. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. That's what he said. And then Jesus, the Lord said, Thy fool, this day I require your soul. What an endless road. That's why that Bible, the Bible says that road is wide that leadeth to destruction and many will be found thereon. Now, are we exempt from this? No. It can happen to any of us. We can go down into the city of Vanity Fair in a place where you're just supposed to be passing through, you end up staying and living there and dying there in an endless, silly pursuit. These two men that went through Vanity Fair were on one pursuit. They was on a pursuit to the celestial city. And Abraham, that's what they said, he said to them. No doubt they asked him, where are you going, Abraham. He said, I'm seeking for a city Amen. with foundations, <laughs> right, yeah. that is built by God. Yeah. Amen. That's what Abraham, he wasn't looking, he had a tent. He wasn't looking for a permanent resident here in, in this world. He was looking for the celestial city, amen, a city of God, amen, even back then, amen. And people ask you, praise God, what are you looking for? I'm looking for the city of God, amen. Glory My purpose is to serve him. Amen. Serve him. <laughs> and that's not boring. And it's so, like I said, it's so vast that you can't begin to understand it. And I can't either. What a relationship. <sighs> He's got endless work for us to do. <laughs> endless. It's endless. If people just come out of the city of vain fair and follow Jesus. But I know who the king of vain fair is. 
It's the devil. <laughs> and that's where he wants people to be stuck. That's where he wants us to be stuck. And it's easy to get stuck there. I've been stuck there myself. Anybody else? Amen. Every one of us has been stuck there at the time. And the Lord had to show us that this what you're pursuing is a dead end road. You need to stop, stop it, and pursue me. Amen. Amen. So it's a lesson we've got to learn. Everybody's got to learn. Because there ain't nobody going to get out of going through the city of Vanity Fair. You're going to walk through it. You're walking through it right now. You're walking through it. But you're going to want to stop it. And don't partake of it. Don't partake of it. Amen. Don't partake of it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Vanity Fair. It's destroyed a lot of people. It still is. It's real, Brother Dave. It's real. So, so you got to, you, the only way you're going to understand this is real if you really understand the true meaning of life. And that understanding of your life is Jesus Christ. It's the whole purpose. So I love you all. Thank God for you. Uh, would you stand with us, those who can? If you need to come pray, just come. Come on.